ourselves and our families, and that sometimes that means some grunt work, but that does not mean that we don't need to do the task before us to the best of our ability. When we speak of a good work ethic, we're talking about the character, attitude, and integrity with which we complete our work. We're talking about the care that we put into the task and that we want from others as well. It's why group projects can be so frustrating when there are people who don't contribute or people whose work is not good quality or people who drag everybody else down with their negativity. On the other hand, it also means that when everyone is committed to putting together the very best of their gifts to create the very best product and outcome, something truly amazing can happen. The ordinary becomes extraordinary. The book and then the movie that's based on it, Hidden Figures, gave us a glimpse of that. Thousands upon thousands of engineers, mathematicians, scientists, astronauts, and more came together to imagine something that had never been seen or done before, and then they used their gifts and strengths to make it a reality. We see it when a cast comes together to put on a play or a musical, whether it is on Broadway or in the school auditorium or anywhere in between. It's that moment when that coalition, the legislation for which we have striven so hard is finally passed. Or it's the relief when a complicated surgery is finished and the patient can begin to heal wherever those moments of teamwork produce the fruit that we want to see. When we are all committed to something and we are all working our hardest to make it a reality, we realize that the whole truly is greater than the sum of its parts and that we have an important role to play in making that happen. When we all have a good work ethic, magic can happen. Lots of you know that I love words and their meanings and connections, and so when I think of the word ethics or ethic, I think back to its root word, which is the Greek word ethos. Merriam-Webster defines ethos as the distinguishing character, sentiment, moral nature, or guiding beliefs of a person group or institution. In other words, it's the way in which an individual or an organization lives life and conducts business. If our ethics are guided by truth, integrity, and love, the end results should be an increase of truth, integrity, and love. If, however, we're guided by selfishness, anger, or a desire for retribution, then our end results will reflect those values. When businesses are primarily guided by an ethos of financial gain for shareholders, they tend to sacrifice quality and even safety in the name of profits. And we have seen news story and consumer report after consumer report detailing those failures. For our teachers in the audience, when A plus students put in C effort, natural ability might be able to sustain them for a while, but eventually it catches up with them. The examples go on and on. Simply put, we get out of something what we put into it. Amen. And so we want to make sure that we are giving our very best. Our gospel reading for today finds the disciples in much that same quandary that you and I face each day. Do we live our lives by the ethos demonstrated and commanded by Jesus Christ? Or do we live according to worldly values? 
to place the disciples, give them a little context. In the era of the New Testament, young Jewish males would be taught the basics of their faith, including reading and writing, your very basic educational tools. They'd be taught at an early age, both at home and in the synagogues at synagogue schools. And then after they learned these basics, rabbis would then invite those who had displayed a particular aptitude for learning to study further. So by around the age of 12, most boys would have been apprenticed in some sort of trade like carpentry or fishing or something of that nature. And only those, the select few that the rabbis found most promising, would continue on with formal learning and education in any sort of way. Since all four Gospels tell us that these 12 disciples were a motley crew of men from a variety of trades and walks of life, I think it's pretty easy to infer that they had not been among those most promising of students. In contrast, those chosen by rabbis to become disciples of that rabbi would then grow into important political and religious community leaders. They were the big deals of the day. And we find that throughout the Gospels that they are the ones with the places of honor and prestige at gatherings and celebrations. And like today, those people in the highest places of honor and privilege tended to have a lot of people under them following their orders and doing their bidding. On some level, then, it's not super surprising that given this second chance to be chosen by a rabbi when Jesus calls, some of these disciples see this as their ticket to becoming a more important and powerful person in their community. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had been fishermen. Physical, sweaty, difficult, back-breaking work that required both a good bit of skill and a good bit of luck. That's why they call it fishing, not catching. There were never guarantees of bringing home a good profit, and it was hard to save up and get ahead. Being second and third, command under, and third in command under Jesus, though, that probably sounded pretty good. Interestingly, uh, James and John bring their mother to come and ask Jesus uh, this particular question. I always kind of think that their mom gets a bad rap in this story, sort of like she's a, you know, ancient, you know, stage mom. But notice that the boys are right there with her. Amen. In fact, Jesus actually addresses the remainder of the conversation to them, and we don't hear anything from mom again. Regardless of whose idea this was, Jesus is not impressed with the question. And he lets them know that they're asking for something that only God the Father can give. Their priorities are in the wrong place. They're working from the wrong ethos. Predictably, for anybody that's worked with a group of human beings for longer than about five minutes, the other ten disciples are none too pleased when they hear what James and John have been up to. I imagine them sharing a meal around a table together or traveling down the road and getting into arguments, letting James and John know just how presumptuous they had been. You ask Jesus, what? Why should you get one of those places and not us? So you think you're better than we are? Voices and tempers, they start to escalate and feelings are hurt and tensions rise. Or maybe, maybe they're talking behind each other's backs and being passive aggressive and snarky. Can you believe their nerve? They must be kidding themselves. And they made their mom ask. <laughs> However these interactions went down, Jesus calls a timeout. He calls the disciples all together and lets them know that each and every one of them has things backwards. They are all working from the wrong ethos here. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, 
and their great ones are tyrants over them. I always kind of get a picture of like Henry VIII in the back of my mind for that one. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus reminds them that in God's kingdom, things work differently. In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus remove his robe, his outer clothing, wrap himself in a towel, and wash the disciples' dirty, disgusting feet. We're talking not just doing something like bringing them their food at a meal or refilling a water glass, but getting down on his knees on the floor and washing the muck and the grime and the dust of travel from their feet. This was a task for the absolute lowest of the low, not for their beloved friend and teacher. Jesus in this moment shows them that there is no task too menial, nothing too far beneath him when it is done in love and care. Jesus purposefully shows the disciples by example exactly what he means, the lengths to which he expects them to go when he says that the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. In John 13, verses 12 through 17, Jesus says, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your te Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Amen. That message, friends, is crystal clear. We are called to follow Jesus' example of service to others instead of serving and seeking power for ourselves. We are called to live according to an ethos of service in love. What then does it look like when we're living according to that ethos of service in love? What would it mean to have a good service ethic like we have a good work ethic? For starters, it means, as Pastor Emmanuel encouraged us a few weeks ago, to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. Amen. More than that, though, it means to do what God does. We are called to love those around us, regardless of their age, their status, their race, political persuasion, sexual identity, ability, gender, or any other criteria that we as human beings use to separate and categorize ourselves and others. And then it means to put that love into work for the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being of those around us, of our neighbors here and around the world. When we look at Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 through 46, we get, we're called to feed the hungry, to care for the sick, to ensure that the homeless get shelter and the naked get clothes. We're supposed to visit prisoners and welcome strangers. I am convinced, friends, that if we were all to live our lives oriented around this kind of service, we would transform the world so that God's kingdom would indeed come more and more on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. If you are serving those around you and I am serving those around me, then everyone gets what they need and no one goes without. 
what a world that would be. Beyond that, when we harness our good service ethics together, we can do some truly amazing things, much, much bigger than what any one of us can accomplish on our own. When we examine our Methodist history and heritage, we realize that we are part of a movement that brought faith and learning together to found schools, universities, hospitals, and missions throughout the United States and around the world. We have done some incredible things when you look back. These people of faith in the, in the mid to late 19th century and beyond looked beyond themselves, beyond even their lifetimes to people that they could never even have imagined and did things to benefit future generations. As a graduate of two of those institutions, both undergraduate and seminary, I am grateful for their faith and foresight. They invested in medicine in order to heal the sick and improve the lives of those around them. They taught children first in Sunday schools, the only day of the week that was available for learning for kids that were working in the factories, the mines, and the fields. Sunday schools in, ind in industrial England and then in the cities, towns, and the countryside of the United States. They formed agencies that supported missionaries and provided food, clothing, and other goods to those who were in need. And they built churches, friends, in order to share that good news of Jesus Christ and their faith in God down through generations to come. They didn't always get it right and, in fact, sometimes really messed it up. But on the whole, they stepped out in faith everywhere they moved and served those around them in love. Amen. It's in the midst of this fervor during the period of Western expansion in U.S. history that a Methodist leader by the name of C.C. C. McCabe was riding a train when he read a news article about a conference in which Robert Ingersoll, who was the biggest atheist and agnostic of his day, asserted to a conference that the churches of America were dying and wouldn't be around in another generation. Boy, that doesn't sound too different than some of the fear-mongering we hear today, does it? This angered Mr. McCabe, and he disembarked at the next station and immediately dictated a telegram to Ingersoll to be delivered while that conference was still in session. And that telegram read, Dear Bob, in the Methodist Church, we are building a new church a day, and we propose to make it two. Not a dying church. Signed, C.C. C. McCabe. That telegram in turn prompted a chorus to spring up that captured that same spirit. We're building to a day, dear Bob, we're building to a day. All hail the power of Jesus' name, we're building to a day. What would happen? What would happen if we could harness that same communal good service ethic and energy today? No more complaining and bewailing the things of the past. No more insisting on our way or the highway. If we are busy working for each other's good, then we are too busy to be bogged down <coughs> in petty arguments and we're unwilling to succumb to the world's call for power over others instead of Jesus' call to serve as he serves. Amen. Imagine what we could do. We'd be loving the things that God loves, working to change the things that God hates, and doing the things that God does. When we live our lives in light of a good service ethic, we joyfully give of our time and talents in order to put them to use in building God's kingdom and not our own. When we take Jesus as our example, we recognize that there will be periods where we will need to withdraw pray and take a break just as Jesus did so that we can then return refreshed, renewed, and ready to serve again. 
then we're not just thinking and praying God's will, God's kingdom come, God's will be done, but we're working toward it as well. As you can go, if you'll, Baraka, if you'll lower the screen for me. As you and I work together, friends, to live into this good service ethic, I want to leave you with a song that epitomizes how we're called to serve each other. Appropriately, it is called the Servant Song, and thanks to Baraka and Elizabeth for on the fly inserting the song uh, in the slides for you so you'll have the words on the screen. I'm going to teach it to you like I teach our uh, young people at VBS and in Sunday school. So for this first verse, I'll sing a line, and then you sing it after me. Then we'll put the whole of the first verse together, and you'll catch the tune for the remainder of the verses. 930 did a really great job, and I have every faith that y'all that y'all can too. <laughs> It'll be good. It says, Brother, sister, let me serve you. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant to let you be my servant to beautiful let's put it all together ready brother sister let me serve you let me be beautiful y'all thank you for that friends let us live our lives oriented towards serving rather than being served just as our Lord and Savior did 
Let us each develop a good service ethic. Amen. Ms. Chris, if you'll come forward. If you'll stand and join me in our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, number 593 in the hymnal. Thank you. 